Welcome to a Legendarium special about life on a ship during Christopher Columbus's era. In this special, we will talk about life, work, sleeping, and food on a ship during Columbus's era. On August 3rd, 1492, Christopher Columbus and his crew set sail from the southern Spanish port of Palos on three vessels, La Santa Clara, also called the Nina, La Pinta, and La Santa Gallega, also called the Santa Maria. Two of the ships, the Nina and the Pinta, stretched only 50 to 70 feet from bow to stern. The Santa Maria, which served as Columbus's flagship, stretched only a little longer. For 35 days, Columbus and his crew of 86 Spanish sailors traveled westward searching for a passage to East Asia. Of course, their voyage ended with the European discovery of the Americas. However, a series of lesser-known voyages over the previous 60 years had been slowly expanding European knowledge of the African coast and Indian Ocean. For these 15th century voyages, the Portuguese adapted an Arabic ship design into what we call the Caravelle. This ship included a sleek and lightweight hull with an extraordinary ability to sail into the wind. Such ships also included triangular lateen sails that hung at 45 degree angles to the deck. Crew members could point the bow of the caravel with an angle of just 20 degrees off the wind and still take lift on the edge of the sail to move forward. The Latin rigged caravels proved critical in the Portuguese voyages to sub Saharan Africa, where coastal winds blow north to the south. They sped south along the coast and could easily return to Europe against the wind. For Columbus's maiden journey in 1492, he used a Spanish update to the caravel known as the Caravela Redonda, a three-masted ship. The first two masts used conventional square sails for open ocean speed, and a third used a lateen sail for maneuvering on the coasts. In addition to their versatile rigging options, 15th century caravels moved the rudders to the rear center of the ship, as opposed to their medieval counterparts which had them on the side. Yet the main advantage of the Spanish caravel, namely its compact size, also became its greatest disadvantage, at least if you were one of the sailors. Life on board a small ship like the Nina or the Pinta proved absurdly overcrowded and deeply uncomfortable, even by the bleak standards of 15th century life. Most of the crew members came from poor families, who signed up for steady work and food, which could not always be found on land. A few others had entered prisons and accepted service on a royal ship instead of a prison term. Whether volunteers or otherwise, sailors lived, worked, and slept on the decks. The Santa Maria, alone among Columbus's ships, had tiny cabins where the sailors could sleep in between their shifts. On the other hand, the Nina and the Pinta had a single small deck with only one cramped cabin reserved for the captain alone. That meant sailors had to sleep on the deck while their waking co-workers stomped around them. That also meant that if a storm struck while at sea, crew members sleeping on deck would be risked rolling around being knocked into a gun wall and possibly tumbled off the edge of the ship if they failed to react in time. 
And of course, the sailors still awake had plenty of work to do. Sailors constantly adjusted the rigging, trimmed the sails, and inspected the hold for leaks. When they found holes, they plugged them with spongy scraps of old rope called oakum. Whenever they took on cargo in ports of call in Europe, Africa, or later the Americas, they would simply pull up the deck boards and load goods into the hold for safekeeping. Of course, for the sons of poor men, simply having the chance for three square meals a day made the hardships worthwhile. Since the captains wanted their men strong enough to work, sailors had plenty to eat, but little to choose from. Sailors' staples included dried and salted anchovies and cod, pickled or salted beef and pork, and dried grains like chickpeas, lentils, and beans. Of course, hardtack biscuits became the most infamous sailors' food. Columbus's crew would have prepared hardtack by baking a hockey puck of flour and water multiple times, then crushing it into tiny pieces. They then reconstituted it with water and baked it again. Hardtack biscuits proved so rock solid they could only be eaten if softened with water or dipped in the communal slurry served every meal in a large wooden trough. According to lore, some pieces of hardtack became so hard they had to be smashed with a cannonball. Ferdinand Columbus, the explorer's 14-year-old son, reported on the conditions endured by Columbus's fourth voyage to the Americas. He wrote, What with the heat and dampness, our ship biscuit had become so wormy that, God help me, I saw many who waited in darkness to eat porridge made of it, that they might not see the maggots. According to nautical lore, some sailors even threw biscuits overboard if they failed to find maggots in them in the belief that what was unfit for maggots could not be fit for men. In the 15th century, castles and ships made up the most complex of human inventions and required constant work. On top of that, should a ship in Columbus's era become shipwrecked, men knew how to salvage enough timbers and equipment from a wreck to either build a small fort to assist in their survival or even rebuild a smaller ship so that they could make their way to the nearest port of call. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you have anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.